Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about a very specific concept. In general, shh, if I get your attention. In general, throughout the course of this class, we've been doing lectures on you know, large areas, and we'll continue to do that. So we've done you know, lectures on cognitive dissonance, balance theory, um, conformity, obedience to authority, you know, big processes with tons of research in them uh, from different research traditions. We've been trying to put it all together and get some kind of larger insights on human nature and social interaction, uh, and then try to apply them to your everyday life. And that's going to be more or less the gist of today's lecture. It'll again be to try to get some observation about human nature and interaction that might be useful to you in your everyday life. However, today's lecture will be on a much more specific topic. It'll be on a concept called immune neglect. Uh, and we'll talk about it now. Can you all stop talking there? Thank you. OK, so what is immune neglect? Immune neglect is the tendency of people to overestimate the intensity and duration of their emotions, or the intensity and duration of their emotional reactions to things. Uh, so people consistently in research, research shows that people fail to realize that emotional reactions to events will pass relatively quickly. And basically, the reason they call it immune neglect is it's this idea that people neglect that they have a pretty good affective immune system. Now, it's kind of a strange expression, affective immune system. So what is affect? What's this word affect that social psychologists are always talking about? What does it mean? Uh, somebody knows this. Come on. Affect. Affect. When people say affect, what's a one word synonym for affect? Yes? Right. Right. Well, yes. So affect is basically emotion. And so when we say that you have an affective immune system, we mean that you have a sort of psychological immune system that ameliorates or brings back to normal your emotional reactions to things. So people have this affective immune system, just like when a virus hits and you have an, a normal physiological immune system that will eliminate it or hopefully do that, uh, then uh, we have the same thing for emotional uh, emotion and affect that occurs in everyday life. We have an immune system that will bring us back to whatever our normal level of happiness is. Uh, but we tend to neglect that we have this system. We're unaware of it, and we underestimate its effects. And that's why we call this immune neglect. You have an affective immune system, but you neglect it. You're not aware of it, and you're not aware of the extent of it. So the affective immune system, among other things, ameliorates bad experiences. Uh, it reduces the impact of uh, bad experiences on your emotions. We tend to think that when something bad happens to us, something that provokes bad emotions, that we'll feel bad for longer than we actually wind up feeling bad. And then the other side of this coin is that your affective immune system tends to uh, re reduce the impact of positive experiences as well. So positive experience, positive affect, positive emotions tend to not endure as long as we expect that they will, and probably not as long as we would want them to. So your affective immune system, whoa. Yeah, OK, all right. Uh, ameliorates bad experiences, but also reduces the impact of positive emotions as well. Again, we neglect this system. We tend to expect that our emotions and moods will persist longer than they actually do. We overestimate uh, the duration of our emotional reactions to events in everyday life. We're sort of like drama queens in that way. Um, so uh, what's a good example? So go with me on this one for a second. Think about some terrible breakup that you had, some terrible breakup, just heart-wrenching, you know, just, you know, you're, you feel like your gut is being torn out of your body. You know this feeling. It's a terrible feeling, and it's fun to reimagine with me. You know, let's do this. Um, yes, I know, this is, this is going well already, right? This is your favorite lecture of the semester, yes. Uh, no, but really do this for a second. Now, think about that, and think about, I mean, it's almost unimaginable right now, right? Like, where you literally feel physically ill. You feel so terrible, you know? And I think breakups are a great example of of how you can feel this way. I mean, there's other bad things that happen to people, uh, you know, losing, losing a parent or a grandparent or uh, someone that's close to you. And these are, these are horrible things that maybe even feel worse. But breakups are something that, you know, 98% of you or so have experienced something like this. And you know just the utter pits of mental, psychological, physical, and emotional, you know, uh, misery that descend upon you when you have a bad breakup. I'm going to talk about this some more. Um, 
that's great. There's like many of you who look like you're like uh, like some you tasted something bitter. You're just like, oh, why, why would I want to imagine that? Well, think think back to it and think back to the feeling you had when you had that feeling and how you thought it was going to last forever, right? If you'd been asked at the time, you would have given an incredibly melodramatic response to you know your forecasted duration of this emotion. You would say, I will never be the same <laughs> ever. I will always, always feel awful. It's unlikely I'll leave my apartment. I probably will never eat anything but Oreos again in my life. And, uh, and yes, I'm, I'll probably just watch Notting Hill a lot or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Whatever. That movie sucks, by the way. I finally saw that. So <laughs> it does, and you, you know it's true. So, OK. Uh, so this is a good example of how you know, the stronger the emotion, the longer we forecast that it will last. But we're wrong, right? What happened? What happened after this experience? You, know, you felt this horrible, gut-wrenching gut -wrenching misery. I won't go into that again. And how long did it last? You know, maybe, maybe two weeks, you know, maybe three weeks. It started getting better. It didn't go away maybe for a while. Maybe it didn't go away for months. Maybe it didn't go away for years even. But it went away faster than you thought it did, right? You felt better faster. And you, you, you found you could walk and interact with people and eat a normal diet probably within days. Uh, you became functional surprisingly quickly, though you underestimated this. And this is a phenomenon uh, that's fascinated social psychologists, and specifically Dan Gilbert, who's uh, one of the leading social psychologists uh, in the discipline today. He's a social psychologist at Harvard. I think I talked to you guys a little bit about him earlier in this semester. Are we booing Harvard? We, we can boo Harvard. I'm, I'm OK with that. I didn't know. I just didn't get the memo. I'm, I'm down for that. OK. All right. OK. He, he's a professor at Harvard. Oh. Uh, ah. OK. So, uh, so Dan Gilbert's a professor at Harvard, and he has an interesting life story. He grew up in Ithaca, New York, where I, where I went to graduate school, and then dropped out of high school to like get into a VW bus and come out to the Bay Area, I think, and do, well, whatever people did in the 1970s when they did those sorts of things. He's also like a science fiction writer on, uh, in his spare time, writes popular books. Very interesting guy, very, very good lecturer. If you want to see one of his lectures, you should check out those TED Talks online, the TED Talks. These are very good lectures. You should see the Ted Dan Gilbert lecture. Google it. You'll like it. OK, so Dan Gilbert got interested in this phenomenon. Uh, and specifically, I believe he was inspired by this observation that you think your life's going to end when you have one of these bad breakups, and it never does. Uh, and so he wanted to do a series of studies to make the case uh, for the existence of an affective immune system and that we neglect uh, its strength and its existence. OK, uh, and a lot of this research, by the way, is collaborative with Tim Wilson, who wrote the book uh, that you're all reading now. So anyway, Gilbert did a series of studies. In study one, he looked at, I don't know why that happened. Uh, in study one, he took people who had never been through a breakup and found that they overestimated how bad they would feel compared to self-reports of people who had been through a breakup, either in the re recent or distant past. I don't know where he found these people that had never been through a breakup because uh, it seems to me, like you don't even have to be in a relationship to go through a breakup. Do you know what I mean? Like you can imagine that you, you, you know you got something going and it doesn't go anywhere. So I don't understand why these people didn't know, hadn't really been through a breakup. It seems to me like that's, I'm going through these like every few months it seems. So, uh, uh, I know. It's worse. It's worse than you can imagine. So. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so Gilbert et al. did this study and he found that people who had been through breakups, either recently or in the distant past, said, yeah, yeah, you, you know, you get better. It's not the worst thing in the world. And people who had not been through them that were looking forward to it, who were in relationships, were like, oh my God, if I went through a breakup, it would be awful. I would lose, you know, this person I'm very close to. So this is sort of evidence that people overestimate the duration of their emotions. When you ask people beforehand, what's it going to be like, they're like, it's going to be awful. When you ask people, Afterwards, they're like, yeah, it was awful, but I got better faster than I thought I would. OK, study two. He studied something. This is very close. Uh, you can see why he would do this study, because uh, uh, professors, this would really re resonate with professors, who are most of the people who read these social psychology papers. In study two, he surveyed professors who were either given or denied tenure at University of Texas. Are you all familiar with the tenure system? OK, so the tenure system, just in case some, some of you aren't, tenure system is a system where you have like six or seven years when you're excuse me, hired as an assistant professor to make the grade and really like prove that they should give you a job essentially for life. 
And then after six or seven years, they either guarantee you tenure for life, like you, you, know, you can't lose your job unless you do some really whacked out stuff, um, or uh, they fire you. And that's an unnatural and weird thing to do to employees. Um, like after six or seven years, we're gonna either fire you or hire you forever, you know? <laughs> Very strange. Uh, but this is a, a, a great academic tradition. There are a lot of reasons why we think it might be a good idea. And one of the results of it is that assistant professors, uh, people in my situation, they labor under this uncertainty. You know, am I going to make tenure? Am I going to make it? And you worry about it. You know, you can't help but worry about it because if you don't make it, you're fired, you know? And that's not fun, you know? And uh, most assistant professors have incredibly melodramatic uh, impressions of, of how bad life would be uh, if they didn't get tenure. And Gilbert wanted to document this. So we asked people how happy they were uh, after having gotten uh, or, deni or been denied tenure. Then he surveyed assistant professors who were looking ahead to the tenure decision and had them indicate both their current happiness and their happiness that they would forecast they would have after being given or denied tenure. And they were surveyed like, OK, so how happy are you now? How happy, oh, sorry, how happy are you now? How happy would you be right after being given or denied tenure? How happy would you be two years after that, three years after that, and then so on to 10 years? Trying to get a sense of how long these assistant professors would forecast they would feel worse as a result of not getting tenure. And then he wants to compare that to this real data on people who were given or denied tenure and how happy they actually were. Yeah, OK. So here were the results. The results were that forecasters thought they would be significantly happier if they got tenure than if they were rejected for a duration of five years after the fact. They thought, wow, if I get tenure or don't get tenure, I'm going to feel better five years from now. There'll be a noticeable difference. It won't be until like six, seven, eight, nine, ten years that there won't really be a difference in my life if I did get it or didn't get it. So that's, that's, that's how melodramatic we are when we look forward to these things. In reality, there was absolutely no effect on tenure decision on global happiness amongst those people surveyed. When they asked people, you know, how happy are you, you ask these people who either did get it or didn't get it, how happy are you, they couldn't find any discernible differences uh, amongst any kind of number of years since the decision. Maybe on the day, you know, maybe on the, in the first few months, you, you know, you do feel worse, uh, but they didn't survey a ton of people who had just gotten the decision. It was more people that had had the decision happen to them a year before, two years before, three years before, and they found no effect. So this is a massive, massive difference between perception and reality, right? Where these people are not actually particularly that affected in their global happiness by their tenure decision, but they believe they will be for five years. And I'll tell you that that misperception of reality is highly functional for, the, uh, for universities. Universities love, you know, this is a great effect for them, that they can't actually make you less happy, but they can make you believe you'll be less happy uh, for five years. And that'll keep you working. That'll keep you uh, up till 2 AM working on research like I was last night. OK. So uh, study three, they looked at uh, voters' estimates of how they would feel after the result of the 1994 Texas gubernatorial uh, election. So. Uh, who are these people? Who is this person? Uh, okay, I'm joking. Okay, all right. Sorry. Uh, who's this person? Ann Richards, exactly. Uh, and partisanship aside, uh, Ann Richards was a badass woman. I really liked Ann Richards. She actually passed away, um, but was a real cool uh, shit-kicking Texas woman. So, uh, her politics aside, I'm not, tell I'm not telling you any, anything about my politics, but, uh, but as a person, she was super cool. So anyway, uh, voters overestimated how bad they would feel one month after the 1994 gubernatorial election in Texas, uh, depending on whether they, uh, uh, their candidate won or lost. It was a very close election. A lot of people at the time, George W. had kind of come out of nowhere. Nobody, I mean, everybody knew he was the son of the recent president, George Sr., but people, you know, he didn't have this long track record. He'd, I think, been a congressman or something, like a state senator or something like that. Um, but it was one of these things where people were like, oh, he's, he's, he's not necessarily going to win, right? And Richard said, was the incumbent. Uh, and there was a really close election, and George W. did win. Um, and this time, uh, oh, okay, so this time in their study, they used study participants in a longitudinal design. Now, what, what, what is a longitudinal design? Those of you who have taken SOCH 5 probably know this. I think I heard somebody say it over here. Right, it's a study that's done over time with multiple observations at multiple points in time. Uh, so far, what they've been doing is surveying people and saying, hey, you've already had a breakup. 
or you've already had you know, a tenure decision, you know, how do you feel now? And then they surveyed another set of people and said, how would you feel if you were these people? Well, that's you know, an OK method for this. But what would be more convincing would be to actually track the same people over time before and after this decision and show they overestimated you know, how bad they would feel or how good they would feel. OK, oh, shoot. So yes, so what they did was uh, they found that Bush supporters tended to think they would feel way better you know, a month after uh, the results of the election if, if their candidate won. And Richard's supporters thought the same thing. They thought they'd feel way better. But actually, they came back a month later, and there was no discernible uh, difference in happiness between uh, the two sets of, uh, of, of uh, supporters for each candidate. And actually, on the basis of this, Dan Gilbert wrote a very controversial op-ed in the New York Times after the 2004 election, where in the 2004 election, lots of Democrats and Republicans in the country and, and independents uh, you know, had a candidate they were rooting for. And it was this huge, important election to people. And then it was this really close finish. And a lot of Democrats felt really, really bad. Uh, if, if any of you were Democrats in 2004, you remember the feeling. And he wrote this op-ed uh, the next day where he said, hey, uh, don't worry. You're going to feel better. It's not that big a deal. And it just irritated the heck out of a lot of people. Yeah. Yes? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they did do a study of the 2004, and it was the case that people overestimated how bad they would feel afterwards. So it wasn't just that he wrote this op-ed and irritated a bunch of people. He actually did document the effect as well. And they found the same thing, I believe, for, 2000, for the 2008 election, where uh, supporters of McCain thought they'd feel worse uh, than they actually did. Or I, I know they were collecting data on it. I don't know if I, I, I shouldn't say that they got the result, uh, but I think, that, I, think they, I think they did. OK. Uh, but remember, one thing that's important to note here is that people who supported uh, Bush thought they would feel a lot better, too, than they really did a month later. You know, so it was the case in both directions. Uh, the positive affective boost did not endure as long as people thought it would, nor did the negative affective boost of, uh, uh, or sorry, the negative affective drop from, from having your candidate lose. So they conducted some other research. They found that uh, lottery winners overestimate the persistence of positive emotions following winning the lottery. Now that is like the epitome of something where you think you're going to feel better, right? You know, you totally think you're going to feel a lot better. And I'll tell you, knowing this finding, totally screwed up watching that movie Slumdog Millionaire for me. Like the whole movie, I'm like, he's not going to feel that much, but you know, he's not, you know, it's going to be like one month tops, you know, because of Dan Gilbert's research and it's very convincing. He did the five studies, you know. and. Uh, and uh, I totally messed that movie up for me. So, and it's interesting too, because people pump just millions and millions of dollars into the lottery system you know, in America looking for that one chance at happiness, but it doesn't, research shows, it won't really bring you enduring happiness. And there's a lot of specific reasons for that. There's all these terrible stories of people who won the lottery and then their friends just descended on them and just leached money off of them, or the taxes took away you know, 40% of it or something. So there's all these terrible stories about specific reasons why uh, the lottery might, might mess up your social relationships, ruin trust in your social network, and so on. But there's also the immune neglect phenomenon where you're going to come back to your normal set point level of happiness pretty quickly. Uh, you just, you've overestimated how long these effects will endure. OK, another thing. I keep telling you that this happens for positive emotions as well as negative emotions, right? That positive emotional states do not endure as long as you think they will, nor do negative ones. But it is worth noting that the negativity bias is stronger than the positivity bias. So we really, really, really think that terrible negative events will persist, and we way overestimate that. It's a smaller effect on the positive side. We do overestimate the duration of our positive emotions and emotional reactions to things, but not nearly as much as we overestimate the negative side. OK. Uh, here's the big finding. Here's the big, big finding. If the source of the emotional reaction is not readily understood, it impairs the immune system and prolongs the emotional reaction. This is big, OK? So I've told you this story about the affective immune system and how there's nothing you can do about it. But there is something you can do about it. There is something you can do. You can use this principle and our knowledge of this principle in order to 
uh, feel better in a sense. Uh, feel better about negative events and then prolong the effect of positive events. And we'll now talk about this for a few slides. So they conducted a study, they conducted a study of the duration of positive affect, positive emotional reactions, after some random stranger does a nice thing for you. They ran a study where they had people come up to you on the street and hand you like a card that said, that had like a silver dollar, like a nice like silver dollar attached to it. And the note, it had a note attached to it that said, you know, have a nice day or something. Uh, and in, in the other condition of the study, it said, have a nice day. We are the random acts of kindness group. We go around practicing random acts of kindness because uh, we want to be nice to people. Um, yeah, I know, really weird study. So, uh, and then in a third condition, you, you get handed nothing in a third condition. And, right, right. Well, you know, you're normally not handed anything like that. So it would just be like you're living your normal life. And then they surveyed people either immediately afterwards, they had somebody else go up to them and ask them about their emotions, or uh, a few minutes later, they essentially tracked them and then tracked them down and then gave them a survey. And what they found was that everybody felt better after being given this, this silver dollar from a random stranger. You know, if somebody does something randomly nice to you, you feel good. But a few minutes later, the effect had worn off in one of the conditions and in not the other. In which condition do you think uh, the effect had worn off in? Right, in the silver dollar condition where there's an explanation of you know, why they gave it to you. Where it says, we're the random acts of kindness group, we do random acts of kindness for people, try and make them feel good or something like that. In that condition, you feel better right off, same as you do in the one where they just hand you a silver dollar with no explanation, just have a nice day. You feel better right off, but then you go, oh, I understand why they did this. It's not that you, uh, yeah, so you understand the source of this positive affect. In the other condition, you're just like, why did that person do that? I don't understand why this happened. Uh, this is a very unusual, weird thing. Uh, I can't understand it and then get over it. And so as a result, the positive affect lingers longer. And the takeaway on this is if you can preserve the mystery in things that make you feel positive or good, rather than totally understand them and totally codify the source of it, if you can preserve the mystery of things that make you feel good, they'll last longer. Because if the source of the emotional reaction isn't readily understood, then it impairs the immune system and prolongs the emotional reaction. So for positive emotions, for positive emotion-inducing situations, you want your immune system to be impaired. You don't want to go back to your normal level of happiness. You would like uh, to not readily understand the source of the emotional reaction. And they created this in the study, right, by having somebody give you a dollar with hardly any explanation at all. Uh, is this understandable? Do you understand this? If you don't understand it, it makes you feel good. That's good because then it'll endure long. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this brings us to the essay. Oh yes. What's up? Right, okay, excellent question. So uh, why is it, given all this stuff about the immune system, that people do stuff like go to psychotherapy or grief counseling or, or, or any kind of counseling, why, why would we do this? Uh, and I, I'm going to get to this. I'm going to give a pretty thorough answer over the course of the end of this, this lecture. Uh, but the main reason is that uh, it may be the case you never totally did understand it before you just repressed it and put it away. And so the purpose of this kind of counseling, of most kinds of counseling, really is to help you understand the sources of negative things that happen to you. Or at least uh, that, that's what I would say is the main function of counseling. Um, okay, but we'll get to it. So the Pennebaker essay exercise, which you've now done twice, and I appreciate you going with me on this because it's an unusual assignment, possibly the weirdest assignment uh, that you'll ever do in college. Um, I mean, remember, we don't even know what you wrote, right? We tore off the cover page and just graded whether you turned it in. Now, that's weird. That don't happen in college very much. But it did. It happened here. And the reason that I assigned it was to illustrate a concept, and it is immune neglect. Penna Baker and his colleagues have studied the effects of doing a several-day introspective essay writing exercise. And they've done it on college students, people from the community, uh, as in, like, normal people, uh, I don't know why they say that. They're like people from the larger community. And you're like, you're talking about just normal people. Okay. 
So prisoners, people who've been laid off from work, uh, people who are seeing clinical psychologists, new mothers, and so on. So they've done it on, you know, regular folks like, you know, I'm in here, I guess, you're, you're in here. Uh, but then also people that are under some sort of duress, right? People who've been laid off or are in prison uh, or seen, you know, psychologists uh, or are uh, just, just had a kid. And here's the Pennebaker introspection prompt. It's almost exactly the one that you responded to. For the next three days, this is a little bit different. I would like you to write about your very deepest thoughts and feelings about an extremely important emotional issue that has affected you in your life. In your writing, I'd like you to really let go and explore your very deepest emotions and thoughts. You might tie your topic to your relationships with others, including parents, lovers, friends, or relatives, to your past, your present, or your future, or to who you have been, who you would like to be, or who you are now. People sometimes find this distressing to write, and many of you reported back to me that you did find it distressing to write, and people in past classes have uh, reported that back to me. So why the heck do I keep assigning this essay exercise every time I teach this class? Because research shows very positive long-term effects from engaging in this essay exercise. I mean, so positive uh, that it, you may struggle to even believe these effects. Uh, but the research on this is very strong. I read a meta-analysis last year of all these studies uh, that were done on this essay writing exercise uh, over uh, well over a thousand subjects have participated in various studies, all these different groups of people. And they've reported a variety of positive effects on both mental and physical well-being. So, or not just reported, measured in a variety of ways. So mental well-being, people report better mood, higher uh, improved subjective well-being, in other words, happiness, life satisfaction, uh, better grades in college. People who do a three-day introspective writing exercise have a detectively higher uh, GPA in college for people who don't. Uh, reduced symptoms from post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, increased working memory capacity, also, uh, physical well-being. Uh, people miss fewer days of work. They report lower rates of illness, better uh, physical immune system functioning, fewer visits to the doctor uh, or student clinic, depending on the study they did it on, reduced blood pressure, better lung and liver functioning in people who had afflicted lung and liver problems. Uh, so some of these effects are for afflicted populations, people with lung problems, uh, people with arthritis. Uh, immune system functioning effect was amongst HIV patients. And right now, you're probably saying, what the heck is going on? You know, how could this essay exercise that you took part in have these kinds of positive effects on people? How could it possibly be the case? Well, really quickly, some, there were some differences between your assignment and the typical one. I tried to tone it down a little bit. They usually ask you to write about the most traumatic experience of your entire life. I, that's pretty heavy, so I didn't, you know, if you chose to write on that, that's cool. Uh, but I did not require you to write on that. Uh, didn't require you to write it at all. There were optional assignments. Normally, there are not optional assignments, just the option to quit doing it. Um, and you should really write it in about four sessions of 15 minutes each. But I have a limited ability to you know, really get you to do this. So I did the two right. I, you know, I tried to get you to do four sessions. Um, you know, you're going to do what you're going to do, right? So why does it work so well? Why would it be that an introspective essay exercise uh, that you do over three days and four sessions, 15 minutes each, this really small investment of time, how is it they could have such enormous positive impacts on physical and mental well-being? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons. One of them is mental repression slash inhibition, uh, that work that you do, holding at bay negative thoughts that you're trying not to confront and trying not to think about from terrible uh, or challenging or difficult things that have happened to you in your life. Doing that, holding those thoughts at bay, may be very stressful and taxing. And this fits well with some of the results. When you're very stressed out, you tend to pump higher levels of cortisol, and you would have lower reported mood, uh, you would uh, be distracted, your working memory capacity might be worse. But also, when you're pumping lots of cortisol because you're really stressed out, your body uh, sort of channels lots of energy into being mentally aware, producing cortisol, and being on edge all the time, and doesn't do a good job of keeping your physical immune system functioning. Um, so it's the case that non-human animals, primates, that have high cortisol levels tend to get sick at higher rates. Humans do as well. That's why when you get really, really stressed out uh, at school or at work, you tend to start catching colds, uh, catching the flu, and so on. So it's not surprising that if this introspective ex essay exercise can cause you to stop uh, repressing things and stop being so stressed out, then it'll improve your physical and mental well-being. That's not too surprising. Also, it may be the case that you fear a sort of social stigma associated with disclosure about whatever you wrote about. 
Uh, so whatever it is that you wrote about in your essay assignment, maybe you wrote about multiple things, it may be that you imagine in your head that you would face some terrible stigma, people would uh, judge you were you to communicate it. Uh, this is why I think it's useful to have people read the essay. The fact that whatever you wrote will be read by someone, uh, and in a sense it will be understood, you'll be heard, and you won't be judged. But also you'll have the experience of communicating this stuff, even just to the sheet of paper, even just, even just writing it down, can, you can kind of say, wow, that wasn't so awful. I'm not being judged. I'm getting it off my chest. I'm expressing this thought that I have, this feeling or experience I have. It's not so bad. I'm not being judged. I know that's strange that communicating even alone to a sheet of paper might reduce feelings of stigma, but it can. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is the same reason that therapy and counseling works well. Uh, speaking to a therapist or a friend uh, is also helpful for these reasons and others. Uh, this is part of why people who have friends and friendship networks that are really positive or, or lots of friends tend to be happier, and it's why it's important to cultivate and honor good, good relationships with friends. But most of all, this is the biggest reason that we think the Pennebaker introspective essay writing exercise works. This is the biggest reason, is the affective immune system. You have an affective immune system, but remember, you have to understand events in order to get over them. Remember that when you were given the silver dollar with no explanation at all, you felt better longer. Likewise, when something terrible happens to you, or something troubling or disturbing happens to you, and you don't understand it, you haven't created a story or a narrative to understand it, then you can't get over it. Or you can't get over it as well or as quickly as, as you would like to. In normal, normally, your affective immune system will take good care of you. It'll help you get over negative events really quickly, but not if you don't understand them. And there's something about big, traumatic, difficult events and challenges in your life that we, have, we struggle to really understand them in a way that works for our affective immune system. Instead, when something really big and bad happens to you, we tend to just kind of stuff it down and ignore it and not make a story or narrative or framework for understanding it that would then trigger your affective immune system and allow you to get better faster. So, that's one of the reasons we think that introspection, be it on the Pennebaker essay exercise, be it with a therapist or counselor, be it with friends or family members who you trust and can confide in, uh, is one of the reasons that we think that it makes you feel better, is it helps you create a narrative or a story for understanding negative events that happen to you. And if you think back to deep conversations you maybe have had with friends or family uh, or therapists, they have this kind of similar signature, right, where they're you are sort of going back and forth with somebody trying to create a story uh, by which you can understand the events. It's, you know, you try to understand why did that person do that? Why does this keep happening to me? And so on. You have these questions and you try and get answers to them. Um, and consistent with this explanation, they've done a study of what characteristics of the essays that people write in this Pennebaker essay exercise, what characteristics of the essays predict more positive effects. This is something that you're very interested in right now, probably, right? Like, wait, am I one of those people who's going to get higher grades, you know, and go to the clinic less and have better immune system functioning and feel better? Or am I going to be like one of the people where that doesn't happen for some reason? Because um, it doesn't happen to everybody. And they find that those who respond best start out somewhat incoherent in their explanations about things, but then by the end, it becomes a more organized story or narrative. And many of yours in class on the first essay were a lot like this. And in previous, previous classes, it was like this. And mine was like this, actually. When you first go to write about it, it's something you don't think about, right? It's something you try not to think about. Or for a lot of you, this is the experience. Uh, it's something you, you, you don't spend a lot of time articulating. You don't have a coherent narrative for understanding it. But then as you write on it multiple times, over time, you come to be much clearer and articulate. You can articulate the causes consequences, the meaning of it. And it's not necessarily the case that it makes whatever it was you wrote about positive. You know, you can't really do that, right? I mean, depending on what you wrote about, maybe you wrote about, maybe you did the optional assignment, and this is all just pointless. But, uh, the, <laughs> but regardless of what you wrote about, uh, even if it was something that was sort of mild, that wasn't the worst thing in the world, uh, or if it was something terrible, the point isn't necessarily to reappraise it as a positive thing. The point of this exercise isn't self-delusion. It is not uh, to try to reframe something that's obviously a negative thing as a positive thing, that's not the point. And I don't think good counseling does that. Instead, what it does is it causes you to create this narrative for understanding it, triggering your affective immune system. And in this way, you can sort of own the meaning of negative things that happen to you, right? It's a very powerless and inefficacious and 
uh, unagentic feeling to have things that haunt you that you can't do anything about, memories or events from your life that you don't have any power over. And the way they affect you is out of your hands. And as you go to write this essay exercise for the first time, that's kind of what it is, right? You're inarticulate. You don't really understand it. All you really know is that it bothers you. Or again, for many of you, this might have been the experience. But then as you write on, you come to own the meaning and interpretation of the thing that happened to you. And that feeling can be empowering and can put you in charge of your own mind. And that, that, that's a powerful thing. So, uh, so these are some of the reasons why we think that this works. Your affective immune system works well if you understand the things that happen to you. But you must give some thought to the issue in order to construct a narrative or a, 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 you know, a meaning that you, can then, that you can then use to get over it. And this points to one of the fundamental values of counseling and psychotherapy. Counseling and psychotherapy tend to make people feel better and more mentally healthy. But research shows, and this research is cited in the Wilson book, Strangers to Ourselves, research shows that it doesn't matter so much what kind of therapy you go to. In fact, a lot of people go to therapy and they don't even realize that their psychotherapist has uh, some kind of theory or theoretical background that's guiding their counseling. But most of them do. If you're a trained psychologist, you're trained in one of many traditions, like maybe you're psychodynamic or you uh, are, are behavioral therapist or something like that. And a lot of the time, you know, people go, talk about their troubles, leave, and never even really figure out what theory the psychotherapist is working with. But to them, that's some like important stuff. You know, they're like, they're, they're employing that when they're talking to you like every time. They're like, how could you change your behavior? You know, and they're, they're using their theory on you. Uh, but what research shows is it doesn't matter so much. That all of them help. You know, all of the major schools of thought on uh, counseling and therapy, uh, when employed by trained therapists, are pretty helpful to people and make people feel better and lead to more positive mental well-being. And if you're thinking about doing, if you're thinking about going to a counselor, but you're not for some reason, be it stigma or you don't want to admit something about yourself, I would encourage you to, to do it if you think it would make you feel better, because research shows it will. Um, so why is it the case that it doesn't matter so much the theory that the therapist has? Uh, but that regardless of the therapy, they tend to make you feel better. Well, it might be that the main thing that matters is helping the patient verbalize and come to understand <clears throat> whatever it is that bothers him or her. And it may be that that's the main function of going to therapy, is just the same function of the Penna Baker essay exercise, the same function of calling your friend right after the breakup, trying to get a way to understand the difficult and challenging things that happen to you that would make you feel worse. So some conclusions from this little mini lecture on this small topic. Uh, we're pretty good at getting over things. In the case of positive emotions, we're too good at it, right? We would like the lottery to make us feel better five years later. We'd like getting tenure to make you feel better five years later. We would like to be, you know, on cloud nine about uh, our candidate winning an election, you know, a year or two years after the fact, but we just don't. Um, you can't get over the things that you don't understand. And so for negative emotional experiences, it's critical that you create a web of meaning, a narrative, a story by which you can uh, claim order and, and meaning around the negative things that happen to you. And everybody has things that they haven't quite gotten over, things that linger in their mind. And this research suggests that they, they affect you. They affect your mental and physical well-being. And if you could trigger your affective immune system to get over them, you would do better in bo on both fronts. So if you can create meaning or a story for understanding these things, you can get over these things. And uh, this is why counseling and introspection are good for mental health, but not rumination or fixation. Excessive rumination or fixation uh, is not a good thing. So don't, don't take this too far. Um, so the big, big takeaway on this lecture, I know, you're like, wait, I'm supposed to do it a little bit, but not too much? Yeah, well, that is, that is the message. Balance in all things. And so the big takeaway here is preserve the mystery and positive things that happen to you. Don't try so hard to understand their causes. Don't explain them away immediately. Relish your positive experiences. Uh, don't be hurried to understand them. But do rush to make a narrative for understanding and comprehending the negative things that happen to you. Um, oh, yeah, people asked for what are the uh, correct answers to the quiz. Bless you. Um, what? I don't know what I can't. For some reason, I can't. Okay. Okay. There were six questions on this quiz. What were the right answers to them? Uh, research on the police officer's dilemma investigates why African Americans are more often the victims of accidental police shootings. Which of the following is the reason that stereotype threat impairs standardized test performance? Because it reduces working memory capacity? Not because it primes the stereotype of the elderly? That's absurd. <laughs> absurd. Who would study such a thing? 
Uh, Nisbin Wilson's telling more than we can know is a paper associated with the idea that people have little insight into the causes of their behavior. I think I had just stated that like a minute and a half before the quiz, so uh, I'm sure you all got that right. Uh, in Dijkstra-Hals and von Nippenberg, how did priming participants with the concept of professor affect their performance in a game of trial pursuit? It improved it. That one's pretty easy. By the way, somebody uh, found out who you found out what the right way is to pronounce Dijkstra House, right? And how far off am I? Like, yeah, okay, all right. So that's not that. Yeah, okay. So there you go. Um, okay. So according to Timothy Wilson, uh, modern psychologists were reluctant to study the unconscious because of its association with what famous scholar, Sigmund Freud. And what is the central idea of chapter 10 of Haidt's happiness hypothesis? Happiness comes from between. Boo, boo, everyone's booing this. I don't know why. You don't want to know where happiness comes from. Okay, well, I'm sorry then. I, <laughs> my apologies for telling you where happiness comes from. <laughs> or just asking you where happiness comes from. Okay, all right. You've all, you're all done deliberating now. You're done booing and hissing. You're still upset. And you're right to be upset. <laughs> Testing you on the reading material. Okay, well, if you didn't like the last question, you're going to hate this lecture because it's about happiness. Um, so in recent years, like over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an explosion of research on the causes and factors that promote human happiness. And uh, another thing that they call this area besides happiness research is positive psychology. And one of the, this is the only picture I could find that seemed to exemplify happiness. The one I had last year was this disturbing picture of this family, like with these just screaming, smiling faces running, running through a meadow, as I'm always alluding to. And uh, it just disturbed people, and it made them feel bad. And so I'm not going to do that to you anymore. Um, so what is positive psychology? It is the study of what factors increase or decrease happiness, or because they're social scientists and have to have a new name for everything, subjective well-being. Subjective well-being, what is subjective well-being? It is happiness. Why do they invent the, uh, the name subjective well-being? I don't know, but it's irritating. Okay, so this is a new and growing area associated with a lot of people uh, that are really, really good at telling you why you would be happy or not. Uh, Martin Seligman, and then this guy whose name I will now pronounce for you. <laughs> Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Yeah, yeah, that was not easy. And actually, Nora, I wish she was here, because I think she co-authored a paper with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Um, yeah, OK. So I just gratuitously am going to say that a few times, because I can uh, pronounce it. It took me like four years to figure out how to pronounce it, and now it's, it's surprisingly easy. So uh, also, another area where this stuff goes on, where positive psychology research is, is done, is funded, is cultivated, and promoted, is, is here at Berkeley in the Greater Good Science Center. Uh, which, I'm, which I'm associated with, and which is, uh, whose, whose executive director is Dr. Keltner, who teaches a big social psychology class as well in the psychology department. And if you haven't taken it, or Serena Chen's version of the class, I highly advise you take it. It will put my class to utter shame. You will love it, and it'll, it'll fit nicely, I think, with the material you learned here. Okay, so what are some of the methods that people use to study happiness? I mean, how do you study happiness? And one of the distinguishing things about this area is that they tend to study it in creative different ways. Uh, so one thing they do is real simple stuff, large-scale surveys of reported happiness, kind of thing that sociologists and social scientists are doing all the time. One of their favorite things to do is look at how happiness varies across different countries. Does anybody know what the happiest country uh, in the world is? Bhutan, that's right, Bhutan. Who, and Bhutan is so uh, happy that they're happy that they measure progress in their country via uh, their, their collective level of subjective well-being. So when they uh, you know, do things, pass legislation, uh, think about the government doing things, they think about, well, how will this affect our average subjective well-being in the country, which is a very, very sweet way to approach government, if you think about it. Okay, uh, another approach, and again, I wish Nora was here, but you know, she's off doing something, I don't know. Uh, and uh, another thing, uh, I wish she was here because she uses this, this research method, only person maybe on campus that uses it, it and it's called the experience sampling method. And what this involves is you have like a beeper, and you're beeped in your everyday life, and you're asked, you know, how happy are you right now? And you, and you say, I'm pretty happy. I was busy. Thank you, you know. And you just get like beeped and beeped and beeped a lot. Um, and you get to report how happy you are. And it's a good way to observe how happy are people in the course of their everyday life. And it also will ask, you know, what are you doing right now, right? And so they can try and figure out what it is in everyday life that makes you feel more or less happy. 
So the question is, is this the best way to measure happiness? You know, are these large-scale international surveys and then these very small-scale kind of studies where they look at an individual person across the course of their day via the beeper experience sampling method, are these the best methods that we could use to study happiness? Um, and I think, I think that it's not the perfect way. People, you know, remember Nisbet and Wilson, people don't necessarily know uh, the causes. They don't necessarily reliably report their mental states and the causes of them. But they do a reasonably good job of probably identifying when they're happy or not. We don't really have any way to know if they're doing a good job. We have no real other measure of happiness besides what you say, so we sort of have to trust you. And then the method, the experience sampling method in particular, has generated a lot of really interesting findings, stuff we wouldn't know otherwise. I, one of, well, one of my favorite or least favorite, I don't even know, uh, findings is that having children and taking care of them does not tend to increase your happiness. That people, uh, when they are spending their time with their kids, like helping them study or, or playing with them or looking after them or whatever, they report a similar level of happiness as they do when they're doing chores around the house. Um, <laughs> which is a totally distressing and depressing finding, right? Of like, you know, you spend all this time thinking, oh, I'm gonna have a kid, it's gonna be great, my life will be fulfilled. And then, you know, you really just kind of have to wash the dishes more, you know? Um, but it's important to realize that surveys, actually the having children one is one of the most fascinating uh, patterns of data in social science research. Because they also ask people, you know, what is most central to your happiness, to your life satisfaction? People will also say, my children, you know, and spending time with my children and leading them, you know, helping them grow and taking care of them. And so you have this weird contrast where people, uh, once they have kids, or anticipate having kids pin like a large amount of their life satisfaction and the meaning of their life on these children and uh, and raising them correctly, but then also experience it day to day like you know uh, like they're doing chores. Uh, so you know when you have kids, you won't go out at night as much. You know you have to do all this stuff at home. Uh, you have to do all these little errands and stuff like that, and that and it makes you tired and maybe makes you stressed out and overcommitted. But at the same time, your life uh, will have a different meaning. Uh, you'll have different values and you'll be fulfilling them presumably. That's what the research suggests. So, okay, so now we've eliminated having children as something that will make you happy, uh, which is a pretty mean thing to do. Um, but it wasn't me. Don't kill the messenger. And <clears throat> so this raises the question of what does make you happy, right? And, and, and what doesn't? So positive psychologists uh, ironically focus most of all on the things that don't make you happy, uh, which is very funny because they're supposed to be very positive people, but they're not. Um, Okay, maybe they are really positive. Actually, all the positive psychologists I meet are like really, really positive, nice, sweet, apparently happy people. Um, nonetheless, uh, some of their best findings are about the things that don't make you happy. And so in a sense, you could call it positive, negative, counter, double negative psychology or something like that. <clears throat> okay, so what does not make you happy? Well, a lot of the things that people think will make them happy. So positive psychology's big whipping boy, and you probably could have guessed this walking in, is wealth and income. You know, people think money will make you happy, but you can't buy happiness. Every one of you already knew this, but nonetheless, uh, you maybe didn't realize the extent of this effect. And basically what they find is that, yes, it is the case that being homeless or in poverty does reduce your happiness. You know, extreme poverty, having very little wealth or income, that's bad. You know, that will make you feel bad. It makes your everyday life a challenge and a struggle. And there's no question that will reduce your subjective well-being and make you less happy. However, uh, beyond that point where you're being able to put a roof over your head, provide for any dependents that you have, you know, get yourself some food, and uh, you know, get through your everyday life, uh, beyond that level, having more or less wealth or income has very, very little impact on your reported happiness and mood. Uh, it's kind of a surprising effect. Uh, it's also the case that countries, uh, assuming that they don't have a huge rate of poverty, they uh, the wealthier countries do not report higher overall happiness. So it's also true at the country or international level as well. So uh, nonetheless, this is a heavily contested idea with evidence on both sides, but far more research shows uh, no effect. And no, this man is not really happy. Okay. okay, so more stuff that doesn't make you happy. Well, here's another thing that doesn't make you happy is the imposter phenomenon. And I include this because the imposter phenomenon is a phenomenon that's very close to home uh, with college students. And a lot of college students experience this. Uh, bless you. So what is the imposter phenomenon? Uh, the imposter phenomenon is identified in the mid-80s, and it is the feeling among successful individuals that they do not believe, uh, they, excuse me, they do not belong in elite academic or professional settings, and they're just waiting to be found out. 
Um, now, some of you, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because the whole point of the imposter phenomenon is you feel shame and you feel this like lurking dread, like you'll be found out that you were admitted to this professional academic setting by some kind of kind of terrible mistake, uh, and they're going to find you out. You're going to flunk out, or you'll be you know uncovered as a fraud or whatever. Uh, and and so. The interesting thing about the imposter phenomenon is it gets worse as you reach higher levels of achievement. Uh, achievement. So ironically, success can make you feel like a fraud. As you do better and better and better, your self-confidence, self-esteem, concerns about social stigmas that you maybe have doesn't keep up with that. You're the same person that's being promoted to higher and higher levels in society. I mean, look at all of you. You're going to the finest public school in the history of humanity. And, <laughs> and, and some of you probably feel the imposter phenomenon. Some of you probably feel like you're a fake, like you were admitted by accident. Um, you're incredibly wrong about this, and it's ironic that you would feel this as you, at, at your most successful moment, right? Like, here you are, uh, you know, you're somewhere where, that anybody would want to be. I mean, I would uh, love to have gone to an undergraduate institution as fine as the one you went to. Uh, I'm proud of the undergraduate institution that I went to, but I, I could never have gotten in here. You know, I don't know how you got in here, but. Whatever it is, it's magical to me. It's some kind of Hogwarts weird, weird stuff to me. I don't even understand how you pulled it off. Um, but I'm sure you merited it, and I'm sure that coming out of high school, I did not merit it, because um, I was a, uh, anyway. So, okay. And this feeling of the imposter phenomenon is common amongst women and minorities. And that's very unfortunate, because uh, if anything, they face greater challenges to uh, gain admission to places like this. So uh, presumably this is due to social stigmas that erode self-confidence and lead people to feel like an imposter in these elite environments. And again, if you believe this, you are wrong. You do belong here. This is uh, Walter Robinson. He's a friend of mine. Anybody know who this guy is? Yeah. Yeah, he runs admissions. He runs admissions here at Berkeley. Walter uh, is an incredibly intelligent man. He hasn't made a mistake, much like Nora, in five, six, seven years, maybe 50 years. I don't know. He's not even 50, I don't think. But anyway, he, uh, he's, he hardly ever makes mistakes. You are not a mistake. If you're here, you belong here. Uh, the rate of error at this place is tiny. Walter is a perfect man. He's also, <laughs> he's also a very sweet guy. The guy's like a machine. He just goes through and he's like, yep, you deserve to be here. I'm right. I know I'm right, you know? And that's how it works. So if you're here, you belong here, and you need not face lingering doubts and concerns about stigma. Don't, you know, so get over your self-confidence issues and own it. You know, you've achieved, you've reached a great level. You need to own that now. Okay. Okay, more stuff that doesn't make you happy. I told you it was positive psychology, right? So, okay. This is very much along this, uh, similar lines to the wealth, income, money doesn't make you happy line of reasoning. Um, possessions. Possessions do not make you happy, at least not as much as experiences do. Uh, especially, I thought that said except uh, flashy luxury items. Uh, no, especially flashy luxury items. You think that these flashy luxury items are going to make you feel happier, and they don't. They don't. They, they just dig the pit of despair deeper. Um, that was, a, that was a joke. It doesn't really do that necessarily. Okay, what movie is this from? Citizen Kane. Okay, uh, and Citizen Kane is a great film about uh, who? This famous historical figure. William Randolph Hearst, uh, who uh, lived actually in the Bay Area or near the Bay Area, um, owned which newspaper in San Francisco? The Examiner, right. Um, so he owned the Examiner. In any event, the whole kind of point of Citizen Kane, I'm going to try to not give away the ending here, but the main point is this guy had flawed positive psychology theories. He thought that wealth and, ha uh, and income and possessions, most of all, would make him happy. And indeed, he dies alone in a, in a house full at San Simeon, I guess, uh, at his, at his uh, big palace at San Simeon. Uh, he dies alone with all these possessions, more possessions maybe than any person has ever accumulated ever in human history, uh, more luxury items, and yet he's, uh, he's desperately unhappy because he's neglected uh, to invest in relationships and positive experiences in his life. And so the, it's this irony that the richest man might be the unhappiest. So Van Boven and uh, Gilovich in 2003 did a study on more or less this idea. And they were interested in showing that possessions uh, will make you less happy than experiences. And try and make the case that you should invest your resources in experiences more than possessions. So how did they do this? What they did was they conducted a series of surveys that showed that at the time of purchase, people tend to overestimate the value of possessions to them. They, they assume that these possessions will be very valuable to them, not just at that point of purchase, but also a month later, a couple months later, that they'll, that they'll think, oh, you know, this DVD that I got, 
um, you know, this DVD that I got cheap at Target, this copy of Super Troopers or whatever. Like, you know, I got a really good deal on it. I feel terrific. Uh, it's very valuable to me. I will feel it will be valuable to me in two months as well. Um, that's a bad example because that, that would make you feel great uh, for quite a while. Um, uh, and the assumption, people are making the assumption that the goods are durable in their value to you. That you'll, you know, if this, is, if this DVD is, is worthwhile now, it'll be worthwhile in two years, it'll be worthwhile in four years. Obviously, that's foolish because they'll invent like three new technologies that will cause us to have to sell all our DVDs for 20 cents each. So uh, longer term perspective, though, people prefer experiences. So um, experiences tend to make you happier. They, OK, all right, so, so the way that they make the case for this is they survey you about experiences you're about to have and about experiences you have had. And experiences make you happier, and they have a more enduring source of happiness. They're, you value them for uh, years and years after the experience. I, in some cases, ironically, experiences can be more valuable uh, years later. Like I've gone on vacations before where I was kind of like, man, I'm getting tired of this vacation. I'd rather go home and get back to work or do something, you know, or just you know, see my friends or something. I'm getting tired of this. And then, you know, the next two days when I was like, man, get me out of, you know, country X, uh, you know, I actually did stuff that I now remember as these, like, amazing times, like the best time I had that year. And at the time, I was kind of like, yeah, yeah. So experiences don't just endure in your value of them and their provision of happiness to you, but they might actually increase under certain circumstances. And the takeaway is that when you look back at your life and you say, what, was the, what were the investments of money uh, that were most valuable to me, that paid off the most. It's going to be the times that you took your money and you invested it in having good experiences. Why is that? Well, because experiences contribute to relationships um, and are closer to one's identity. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I must have been thinking something at the time. I was like, on, I must have been very happy when I wrote that. I, <laughs> um, I really, I have no idea what the heck that meant. Okay, so we're going to skip. We're going to skip that. If you figure out what that is, email me because I don't know. Um, and then uh, <laughs> experiences are actually more durable than possessions anyway. Your possessions will lose value over time, not just subjectively, but objectively, right? They replace the DVD technology. You get tired of, of playing with that unicycle you bought last week. Most, most of you have done this last week. Uh, you'll get tired of it, but that experience will be with you forever. And so it's really easy to understand where this bias would come from, right? If you're looking at a, a possession, something that's tangible, that's you know, going to still be around, you're in a landfill 30 years from now, and then you're looking at something fleeting, right? An experience. You're going to lose that, right? Like you go to that party, you go to London, you know, you, you go to you know Thailand or something like that. That's going to be over when you get back, right? But the exact opposite is true. You're going to have that experience forever, and that possession is not going to matter to you at all pretty soon. Hey, we were talking about the experience sampling method. We were talking about you. Yeah, there you go. Um, it is cool. Yeah, our campus's leading user of the experience sampling method is here. Okay, uh, more stuff that doesn't make you happy. Remember, this is very positive. This is a positive lecture about positive things, positive stuff. So what else does not make you happy? Uh, excessive rumination and fixation on problems. Now, I'm not talking about the Penn and Baker essay exercise. I'm not talking about taking things that you're repressing, creating a narrative that triggers your affective immune system that allows you to get over things that you haven't gotten over. Instead, what I'm talking about is just rolling around in your unhappiness or your problems, fixating excessively on it rather than moving on um, and doing some with yourself. So uh, this is something Bertrand Russell. Are you all familiar with Bertrand Russell? Bertrand Russell is one of my one of my heroes. He's a great mathematician and philosopher, and uh, decided in like the 40s and 50s, uh, and maybe even before that, to start being a kind of a pop writer. And he'd write these cool books about like you know what makes people happy. He wrote these books about pacifism. He was kind of this famous pacifist in Britain. And uh, uh, among among the books that he wrote. Were, uh, was, was a book called The Conquest of Happiness, which you might enjoy. You might pick it up. It's old, but it's good. And Bertrand Russell, in that book, identifies one kind of unhappiness that he calls Byronic unhappiness, where, uh, which is typified by people sitting around, ruminating on the negative experiences that happened to them, fixating on, uh, on their melancholic poetry, and, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, and he says, this is bad. You should instead keep your mind active and occupied. Your mind was designed for doing. And if you do something with it, it will provide you happiness. Uh, and this relates a little bit to the concept of flow, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so physical activity, meditation, I know that sounds like not doing something, but it actually is doing something. Uh, work, time spent with friends and family. These things are good for your subject. Can you all stop talking there, please? You. Thank you. 
These things are good for your happiness and subjective well-being, uh, and they'll make you feel better in your life. Uh, sitting around fixing on your problems, not so much. Okay, uh, mentally processing your troubles is valuable. Counseling, Penna Baker essay exercise, rumination and fixation, not helpful. Okay, so finally the positive psychologist will do something, say something positive. Okay, so what does make you happy? Okay, well there's two general categories of things that make you happy. Uh, there's things that are fleeting and things that are enduring. Now this is not the PG rated version of this lecture. I'm just going to give it to you straight. Why not? It's just true. That's what the research says, and why would I lie to you? I care about you so much. Okay. So, there's two categories. One, fleeting. Let's talk about fleeting sources of happiness. Things that make you feel happy in the moment. Uh, things that, in the experience sampling method, you'll be like, yeah, I feel great right now, when they beep you. Uh, these include sex, food, back rubs. Uh, that, that sounds... Various combinations. Be very, very careful combining these things. Be very careful. Be very careful. <laughs> they do not necessarily mix well. That has not been explored with systematic research, to the best of my knowledge. Nobody knows what will happen. Okay. And as interesting as those things are, we're going to list them and then we're going to move on uh, because the enduring sources of happiness are more interesting and they're more like appropriate to talk about in a college class. Okay. Uh, which is something I'm very big on, talking about appropriate topics. Okay, so, uh, so what does make you happy besides these fleeting sources of happiness? And it is the case, oh, did I, I actually, yeah, food, okay, yeah. So uh, when you're beeped, among the things that makes you feel most positive is when you're like in the middle of eating, uh, which kind of, cons cons uh, kind of creates this kind of funny image where you're getting this beeper, your mouth's like full, and you're like, oh, I feel so good, you know, I feel great. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so apparently that's like your high highs, is like when you're eating, you know, just, you know, anyway, so. Uh, it's a funny sort of gluttonous image, but uh, it's apparently true. So, <laughs> eating makes you happy. This shouldn't be a shock. We knew that. Um, this kind of confirms that. Um, but what, what are more enduring sources of happiness? All those things don't last, uh, I'm not, okay, they don't last as long as these other things. Okay, so uh, what are these other things? Relationships, family, friends, romantic relationships, uh, strong, enduring, intimate, open, uh, supportive relationships. Uh, this might be the biggest thing that you can control that will provide you with happiness, is creating and sustaining meaningful, positive, supportive, deep relationships with people, friendships or romantic relationships, uh, with family, friends, uh, and so on. This is uh, perhaps the biggest thing you can do to positively shape your life is, is to create these things. And this is the takeaway from Jonathan Haidt's chapter 10, right? Is that happiness comes from between. The happiness is socially created and you're gonna find it through your relationships. Uh, you're gonna find it by, in the way that you interact with other people and how they, how they interact with you. On a related note, pro-social behaviors make you happy. This is kind of interesting. So uh, pro-social behaviors are behaviors that you do that benefit other people more than they benefit you. Or at least that's the way that, w that we define them. But this is sort of strange, right? Like, why would pro-social behaviors make you feel happy? You would think they'll make the benefactor feel happy, but why would they make, or the benefactor, they'd make the recipient of the pro-social behavior feel happy, but why would they make you feel happy? Well, it's not entirely perfectly understood why it is that pro-social behaviors make you feel happy, but it's extremely well documented. There's uh, research showing that uh, when you give to charity or when you volunteer for some cause or effort that you value, that you think is important, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better about yourself. It increases your mood at the time. It gives your life greater meaning uh, that sustains you and increases mood uh, for a great duration of time afterwards. Helping friends. Being there for your friends makes people feel better. Um, expressing gratitude. Something I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow night is uh, gratitude and how it's one of the ways to happiness and one of the ways to sustain positive relationships. So in this way, generosity is its own reward. And there was a very, very nice study that was done recently in science which used longitudinal, correlational, and experimental data to show that people are happier when they spend money on other people than when they spend the same amount of money on themselves, which is a really fascinating finding, you know? Because they also find that people systematically believe that the opposite is the case. That you're gonna feel better when you spend money on yourself, right? You know, buy that, you know, that DVD or that trip or whatever. But actually, when you spend the money on other people, that's what makes you feel uh, the best. Oh, and then also exercise, physical activity, fitness, these are things that can increase uh, your happiness as well. Everybody's packing up. I don't know why you're packing up. We got some time left here. Okay. Okay. Flow. 
So, flow is a concept by, can you say his name? Do you know? Chicksemihai? Not Chicksemihai? Ah, okay. Mihai Chicksemihai. Dang. Uh, I was so proud of myself. Oh, man. All right, I'm not even going to try to do it now. Okay, uh, Mihai uh, has this concept called flow, <laughs> which he discovered using the experience sampling method, this thing where they beep you and ask you how happy you are and what you're doing. And what he found, and this is the, maybe the big observation from this research, the thing we didn't know about. Yeah, you, knew you, you know you feel good when you're getting a back rub and you're eating ho-hos, and so we all know that. That's, <laughs> there's nothing like it, nothing like it. Uh, but what we didn't know so much was how happy you feel uh, when you're uh, at flow. And flow is when you become totally immersed in a task that is both challenging and stimulating, well-suited to your abilities. It challenges your abilities and meets your abilities and uh, doesn't overreach them, doesn't bore you either. It's challenging and stimulating, and you're pretty good at it. So shooting baskets, you know, when you start hitting baskets, when you're shooting around, like you start to feel that feeling like you're, you're, you have flow, like you're in the zone. There's no better feeling. I actually think the best time I had in junior high was this time I hit like 12 straight three-pointers. And I, just, I literally remember this as maybe the best time I had uh, during my adolescence. Um, <laughs> it's ridiculous. I was unconscious. So uh, uh, rallies in tennis. You're hitting the ball back and forth with somebody in tennis or in ping pong or something like that. You feel good. It's, it's very fun. You get lost in the task. Uh, driving, juggling. Most of you spend most of your time juggling. That makes sense. <laughs> Research supports that. That will make you happy. Um, driving, I don't know about that. I don't really lose myself driving. I get kind of bored. But anyway, uh, here's a really good uh, source of flow. A good conversation, right? Like a really good conversation. In some ways, this is what defines a good first date, right? Or second date or whatever, is you get that flow kind of conversation going where you're just on the same level, the person's saying things that are interesting, stimulating, and challenging to you, your mind's totally lost in the task, and you're in sync. Uh, dancing, I wouldn't know much about that, but I hear that it provides you the feeling of flow. Uh, it wouldn't if you were dancing with me. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so in flow, your non-conscious is fully occupied, your conscious mind is active, guiding your non-conscious, your self-consciousness is subdued and distracted, uh, it's almost like a sort of active meditation. So we'll stop there for today. And